and you have the imagery of the snake, the serpent coiled around the the tree as evil, whereas in this um, polemicized, uh, you know, what do you what do you satanic? I guess because it's it's opposing it. This is the symbol of wisdom and knowledge, and for some reason, one's bad, one's evil, and it's like what's they're at odds here. So yeah, yes, and so very long story short, and and. Um... If you want to to see my uh, more in-depth analysis of this, in Prometheism, I get into this in in greater detail. And also, believe it or not, in my book, Closer Encounters, I wrote a book on the UFO phenomenon called Closer Encounters. And it's it's a bit of a tome. It's a comprehensive analysis of the entire close encounter phenomenon. And in chapter six, in the penultimate chapter of that book, I get into Christianity in depth and detail and the genesis of the 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 christ mythos okay and how it is a form of social engineering uh by means of cognitive dissonance Mm. so in the christ mythos you have on the one hand jesus in the gospels very clearly saying that jehovah is his father that he's there to represent yahweh yahweh is his father And in fact, not a dot of an I or a cross of a T from the Tanakh, the Old Testament, will pass out of existence or out of relevance until the end of the world. And so Jesus, speaking through one side of his mouth, affirms all the legalism of the Old Testament and takes pride in being the son of this genocidal, tyrannical, maniac, sadist, who is responsible for Moses' slaughter of these poor golden calf-worshipping, dancing Israelites in the Sinai Desert, who's responsible for the genocide at Jericho, who's responsible for, like, just all the most horrendous, brutally inhuman acts you can imagine um, that are chronicled throughout the Old Testament. And, of course, for all the wonderful laws in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, right? I mean, the most, like, despicably inhuman uh, legal code and um basically structure of theocratic authority that we've seen in human history and so jesus on the one hand is coming to validate all of that and when you look at jesus from that perspective you know through those particular verses in the gospels then the only problem sure he says to the jews you know you you're you're disinherited the kingdom doesn't belong to you anymore it belongs to humanity it belongs to anyone who follows my father right Right. Well, from that perspective, his only problem with the Jews is the same problem that Yahweh had with the Jews throughout the whole Old Testament, where Yahweh keeps telling these Jews, you rebellious people never learn the lesson. He says they're a uniquely rebellious people, right? Because they keep disobeying somehow. Calls them stiff-necked people, yeah. Stiff-necked Israelites. They keep setting up idols of various kinds. They're worshiping Ishtar and Baal and this one and that one. Okay. And so Jesus's problem with the Jews is, is just that. It's that, look, Yahweh's had enough with your stiff, stiff-necked rebelliousness, and so you're disinherited. You're not the chosen people anymore, and the kingdom belongs belongs to anybody who submits to Yahweh through me. So that's one Jesus, and that's the Jesus that you know. For all the differences between Catholicism, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, and Protestantism, including the evangelical churches in the United States, for all the various doctrinal differences between these warring sects of Christianity. All of them accept that version of Jesus in one way or another. That's the institutional Jesus. And then you have this Gnostic Jesus. And what is this Gnostic? And and there are verses in the Gospels that support that too. Absolutely. There are verses in the Gnostic Gospels. And what the Gospels that were rejected at Nicaea, right? And what does this Jesus tell you? Well, this Jesus tells you, I mean, that, you know, the law, uh, you don't need to follow the law as long as, you know, you. you Circumcised in the heart. Yeah. it's about the spirit and not the law and the world is a fallen material creation anyway and jesus is here to free you from the world because just like him you're not of the world and the world was created by these inferior archons and not by the true god and he's the way to find the true god and so on and so forth yeah but here's the thing the gnostic version of christianity is pacifist yeah the Gnostic Jesus is a radical pacifist who rejects political rebellion. To the extent that you embrace the legalistic Jesus that affirms Yahweh in the Old Testament, 
maybe you could see that Jesus as a kind of political rebel. Right. But if you go in the Gnostic direction, then you're really emphasizing the pacifistic passages in the Gospels. And so Gnosticism, Christian Gnosticism, is a doctrine of pacifism. Why? Because this is a fallen world governed by archons. And to the extent that you participate in political power, you are being corrupted by archons. Power is inherently corrupting right. from a Gnostic perspective. And if you ask me, and I've laid this argument out at length in my various writings, like I just said, this is cognitive dissonance. This is a doctrine directed to demoralize and uh, degenerate society. Because first of all, you're left in an in a intellectual contradiction. Yeah. You're left in an intellectual contradiction that do I follow the Old Testament? Don't I follow the Old Testament? This Jesus keeps contradicting himself, which then it screws with your head. It's cognitive dissonance. You're made to believe. You're made to take on faith two things that are contradictory, to believe them at the same time. Yeah. And what does that do? It puts you in a mental state where you, you, you're suffering extreme tension. And in order to resolve that tension... You will latch on to anything as a life raft. It's a psychological tactic. It becomes a buffet of ideas that you can just pick and choose from. You know what? You know what? Real quick, I just want to jump in real quick because one of the oldest monasteries that was abandoned when the when Islam took over the Byzantine Eastern Empire, for, right next to where they thought Mount Sinai was, which is I don't know if it really is or not, but anyways, there's a there was a monastery there, and there's one of the oldest depictions of Jesus in the world that they found in this place. And they figured out that if you mirror one side of Jesus' face, you get a perfect image. And if you mirror the other side, you get a perfect image. They're, they're imposing two different faces on Jesus' face to show his dual nature. So the early Christians knew what you're saying right now. This wasn't a secret. There, the, 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 this whole idea of putting a Bible in one spot and making a canon wasn't even a thing. Marcion had his own gospel. He had... He, he picked and chose what Jesus he wanted to have in his own Bible. The Gnostics had their own Jesus. The other guys had their own Jesus. It wasn't until later that they put it all in one spot. And that's how you get this weird schizophrenic message. Yeah. But yeah, but, but, to, but to add... Well, but here's that, my you know, point, Neil, is right. that regardless of which Jesus you go for, right. neither the institutional legalistic Jesus who is the son of Yahweh, nor the antinomian Gnostic savior is a figure who inspires active rebellion against unjust divinities, let's say, not to call them gods, right? The right. beings that become God and the angels for the Christians and used to be Zeus and the Olympians for the Greeks, right? Neither image of Jesus inspires active meaning political rebellion against the unjust rule of heaven so gnosticism is inherently disempowering christian gnosticism is debilitating because of its pacifism right because of the association of power inherently with the archons whereas in the myth of prometheus you see a prototype for all of the most positive elements of gnosticism but you see them in a context which totally rejects pacifism and calls for a militant uh, resistance against the unjust tyranny of heaven over the earth sure. and a demand for the self-determination of mankind. So in that sense, uh, Prometheism, a kind of theism based on Prometheus, a, you know, the spirituality that's implicit in the myth of Prometheus is proto-Gnostic but it's satanic. And this brings me to the other aspect of your, your question about, you know, where is Prometheus today? What happened with Prometheus later? Um, and so we see a reappropriation of the myth of Prometheus uh, at the dawn of the modern age, where you have romantic poets. I mentioned Goethe earlier. Uh, also Lord Byron, who writes a poem about Prometheus. And then most famously, Byron's best friend, Percy Shelley, who writes uh, Prometheus Unbound, which is a four-act play about, you know, the whole mythos of Prometheus, including the parts of the story that were lost in the version of Aeschylus about Prometheus ultimately being freed from his chains and 
and uh, so on and so forth. And one really interesting thing about the, the uh, Prometheus Unbound play written by Percy Shelley around 1820 is that he uses all Latin names for the characters. Hmm. Like he uses Jupiter instead of Zeus or Mercury instead of Hermes, but not for Prometheus. <laughs> and what would Prometheus be in Latin? Lucifer. And he makes it abundantly clear, Shelley does, that the flood, you know, the flood that Deucalion helps save some portion of mankind from, is the flood of Noah. And that the civilization that was destroyed uh, by uh, Yahweh was Atlantis, is the Greek Atlantis. The, the ruins of Atlantis at the bottom of the ocean feature in Shelley's Prometheus Unbound play. And so Shelley underlines the fact that Prometheus is, is deeply connected to Atlantis. It's not accidental that, or incidental, that the king of Atlantis is named Atlas. So Atlantis means the realm of Atlas. That's where the name Atlantis comes from. It means the realm of Atlas because Poseidia was ruled by a king called Atlas. In fact, the kings were all called Atlas. And so I'm guessing this was a title, not a, a proper name of a person. And the, the person who was the sovereign of Atlantis was given this title in reference to the brother of Prometheus, namely the Titan Atlas, who leads the Titans in war against the gods. He's the general of the Titan army in the Titanomachia. And what do the Atlanteans do? The core of the myth of Atlantis that Plato recounts for us in Timaeus and Critias is that the Atlanteans lead a war against Olympus. They attempt to unify the whole earth under their naval rule. And they're no longer worshiping the gods. They've become totally irreverent toward the Olympians. And this is why when they're on the brink of unifying the whole earth, uh, Zeus decides to wipe them off the face of the planet with this deluge. So Shelley in Prometheus Unbound depicts the destruction of Atlantis and he makes it quite clear that this is a parallel to the biblical flood story. And he's associating Prometheus with the rebel angels, with the fallen angels who were punished by Yahweh. And so point being in the modern era, you see authors like Goethe, Lord Byron and Percy Shelley explicitly appropriate uh, the myth of Prometheus um, as a uh, positive image of Satan, right? I mean, people often uh, talk about Satan as, um, as an entirely negative figure that cannot be you know, dissociated from Christianity, that's predicated on Christianity, that's parasitic on Christianity, but folks, there's a Satan before Satan, and that's Prometheus. And, you know, uh, one place that this becomes abundantly clear is in uh, the modern Prometheus, right? You ask about, you know, where is Prometheus today? Where is Prometheus in the modern age? Well, look, uh, the alternate title for Frankenstein, the subtitle of the book, is the modern Prometheus. So Percy's wife, Mary Shelley, pens this tale in which we have an extremely Luciferian depiction of Dr. Frankenstein as the modern Prometheus. Hmm. And uh, so, you know, um, I we're, think we're that's on a the good... verge of a new world with AI and virtual reality and all this cutting edge technology that's really going to change everything. Like we're right on the border of what's about to happen. Yes. And Frankenstein was the first of these great sci fi stories that involved transhuman technologies. And you can see the debt to. Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus throughout the history of modern science fiction, up to and including Ridley Scott's Prometheus. Ridley Scott's film in 2012, Prometheus, the prequel to the Alien saga, is very much a retelling of Frankenstein in a cosmic context. So the myth of Prometheus, I would say, is very much alive. Yeah. Um, well, if you, especially if you combine him with Mithra, because we live in a legalistic age. Everything we do is all, you know, sign this document, you know, make sure that you, everything's lawful. Like, no, but you, you, you have like banking systems and we have systems in place, uh, PayPal. It's all, it's all mediators and, and, and signing on the dotted line and technology. It really is in, in a spiritual sense, 
whether you however you want to interpret this, it's a world ruled by Prometheus hyphen Mithra. Yeah, and the the point is to take back this technology, to uh, you know reintegrate uh, these capacities that we were gifted uh, with by Prometheus for the sake of fostering human flourishing, rather than allowing ourselves to be dehumanized by this technology, right? Prometheus brought the gift of techne to man so that we could determine our own destiny, not so that we could wind up being instrumentalized into something like the Borg, not so that, you know, AI could ensconce us in such a, a fashion as to, to uh, you know, uh, divest us of our humanity and, uh, you know, leave us with a hive mind. So, you know, right now we are at the 11th hour, we're at a key turning point in the face of the technological singularity where we have to uh, basically retrieve the poetic power of the Prometheus myth and to uh, understand technological science in the right way as a tool to empower our evolution so that we can transform, you know, like that uh, caterpillar in the chrysalis into the butterfly, the butterfly that appears uh, at the creation of humanity in the myth of Prometheus. And so, so I would say that, you know, Prometheus is, is a figure that represents the promise of technological science. Uh, but there's also this shadow side, this Frankensteinian danger that we face, right. right? Approaching this technological singularity within this very century. Uh, and so it's more important than ever right now to positively reappropriate this myth and understand the power that it already has over us unconsciously. We need to take that unconscious power, that daimonic power of the Prometheus archetype over our society and transform it into something that's more self-conscious and that can be directed in a positive manner as a force of liberation and enlightenment. Yeah, and do you think for in, in the context of like, um, I don't know, maybe climate change, for example, like if there's some sort of uh, some sort of threat of some disaster on earth, Prometheus being the archetype of this, the only thing that can save us is, you know, we have to figure out a way through technology to get ourselves right. Maybe, I don't know, get, go off into space or something. I don't even know what that is, but that also represents this sort of butterfly effect of like a metamorphosis of the human na of, of, of humanity. Like we need to change something or else if we keep going down this path, it's done. We're done. We're going to be wiped out. Right. Ab absolutely. That's right. But we also need to remember that. So, so you know, retreat Ludditism and retreat back to nature and to pre-industrial society and all this crap that's being promoted by a lot of elites today. Right. Right. Uh, the eco-friendly lifestyle. No, 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 no. We can use technology to right. save the ecosystem. Uh, but the other thing we have to remember is that Prometheus didn't just give us the fire of the forge. The fire that he gifted mankind with is also the fountainhead of all of the arts and crafts. In other words, literature, painting, right? Drama, yeah. as per Aeschylus. So there is a unity of science and art that you know is at the core of the myth of prometheus and we need to uh cultivate that aesthetic sensibility so that we use technology in ways that are poetic in ways that are not alienating and instrumentalizing but that are part of the expansion of the creative capacity of humanity because because prometheus is also the deity of the arts of literature of poetry uh, and that's something that we shouldn't lose sight of, right? As we enter this crucible of the technological singularity, we are going to need to be more artful than ever before so that we use technology as a tool for liberation and empowerment rather than allowing it to be an instrument of dehumanization. Yeah, and I think the idea of becoming like gods by copying what's in nature onto technology, we can create systems of travel or whatever that is just beyond our even capacity to even think about how how great we can be right now you know as shelley says and this is a good note to end on as shelley says in prometheus unbound 
uh, we can come up with arts as of yet, un, as of yet undreamed of. Arts that have been, haven't even been conceived by the mind of the gods, wow. right? And so it's not a question of copying nature. It's a question of bettering nature. We can do better than nature. Ooh. We can do better than the gods. We can Ooh. improve upon nature. And so therefore you see that from a Christian perspective, right? Even including a Gnostic Christian perspective, because the Gnostic doesn't want to improve this world. The Gnostic wants to escape this world. Escape the world. From a Christian perspective, Gnostic or otherwise, this is satanic. Yep. Yeah. The idea that we can do better than the gods, we can we can best God <laughs> or nature, that is the core of the Prometheus myth. It's eating the fruit of knowledge, literally. It's accepting and, and by the way, this it's also reflected in Persephone eating the pomegranate. It's like it's, a, it's like a, a mirror of that. But speaking of the taking the fruit of knowledge, you have just attained true gnosis. <laughs>